Muffs, not mutts. Muffs, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think Josh might have done that. He's Josh. So now it's 6.30. Should it come up automatically, Rob? Yeah, yeah. It has on mine. Not on mine. No, no. <laughs> It, no one, no one else is. Oh my no! What is it we're checking? Oh, oh yeah, just something like live stream flashing on the actual. Um, oh, it does. Yeah. Ah, here we go. All right, I think it's time to start. Cool. Oh, okay. So should I start? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's no one, no one else is. Oh my no! What is it we're checking? Extension. Oh, oh yeah, just something like live stream flashing on the actual. Um, <laughs> oh, it does. Ah, here we go. All right, I think it's time to start. Oh. Oh, okay. So, should I start? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's not... no, mean... what, no one else is. Oh, my, no. What is it? We're turning the extension? Oh, oh yeah, just something like live stream flashing on the actual. <laughs> yes, um, press on that. Oh, it does. Yeah. Uh, I think it's time to start. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, hi everyone. Um, sorry for that really jerky start. I think there was a lot of feedback. Um, but welcome to the online opening of Real Time Constraints. Um, my name's Rebecca and I'm the curator at Our Bike Gallery. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we're a London-based art organisation who support the development of artists working across digital and emerging art forms. Uh, we work with multiple voices in digital culture across the UK and internationally to bring innovative perspectives to art through new technologies. Um, so I'm here with some of the artists from the exhibition. Hi everyone. Um, who I'll pass over to in a moment, but first I'll briefly introduce the exhibition. Okay, so Real Time Constraints features works by Gretchen Andrew, Sophia Crespo and Dark Fractures, Disnovation, Jake Alwes, Ben Grosser, Libby Heaney and Joel Simon. Um, and it was cu curated by Arby and Luba Elliott. Um, so Real Time Constraints was initially gonna be uh, a physical exhibition at our gallery space in London. And when coronavirus hit the UK, we were thinking about different ways that we could make the exhibition happen um, and happen in a way that would make sense to the thematics of the show, but also to the artists, um, many of whom already work on or with the internet. Um, and we've seen a huge increase in the number of online exhibitions over the past few months. Um, but for the most part, you know, they only really present a regular browsing experience. And for us, you know, we really wanted to offer something different um, to look at alternative ways to present the exhibition online. Um, and, you know, it was also important to have this sense of interactivity with the exhibition um, and not just a web page with static images or links or something similar. Um, so the exhibition Real Time Constraints takes the form of a browser plugin and it reveals itself as a series of pop ups um, where the works are disseminated over the duration of a typical working day. So every hour a pop up or a work will interrupt your screen and it will pop up in front of everything else that you have open. I mean, actually, during testing, this was quite annoying, um, especially if you're on a Zoom call, you know, it just it pops up and it completely interrupts you. But that's the way it is. Um, so <clears throat> the exhibition, I guess, more broadly speaks to a society that's already quite accustomed to spending an increased amount of time online for work, you know, for entertainment, for socialising. So we wanted the pop up works to interrupt this daily flow. Um, and as the exhibition lasts for a typical working day, it invites a sense of disconnect from relentless scrolling of, in, of your emails or, you know, other kind of work related stuff that you do on your laptop um, and implementing the exhibition in this way where it interrupts a routine allows for like a, a slowness and a way to digest the work more fully. You know, it's it demands attention in a different form to Instagram or YouTube. It's kind of it really allows for this slowness. Um, so the size, the quantity, the content and the sound of the pop-ups have all been decided upon by each artist. Um, and the exhibition is experienced through a synchronized global approach. So where the viewers 
every viewer, every person who's downloaded the plugin, they'll experience the same pop-ups at the same time, no matter where they are. Um, Nimrod, do you want to add anything at this point? Um, sure, yes. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for joining and uh, everyone taking part. Um, it's been a very interesting process for, I think, us as a, as a gallery, but for everyone involved in creating something that we try to think differently of, of what does it mean to curate uh, online. Um, and I think the, the result, I feel the result from the feedback so far was, was experimental. That it's very exciting to take part in something that is slightly different, that, that allows for a different experience of, exhi of exhibition making, of, of experiencing artworks online. Um, so thank you very much for Rob uh, Proust for developing this uh, platform with us. Um, th this exhibition is has a time stamp. It will end, uh, I forgot exactly, but in September. Um, but this can maybe proceed afterwards to some other kind of ideas uh, that we can develop using the, this platform. Um, it's experimental. There might be some lags now in, in the streaming between what we see on Zoom to what's YouTube and also when we try to engage with the artworks um, online. But uh, bear with us if there's any issues. Thank you. Yeah, so as Nimrod said, um, we're going to be live streaming, as you can see. Um, so if you have any questions at the end of the artist presentations, just put them in the chat box um, and I'll put these forward at the end. Um, but for those of you who haven't downloaded the extension yet, you can do so by clicking on the links that I've put in the comment box. Um, it will just take a couple of seconds to install. And just as Nimrod said, I want to say a massive thanks to Rob. Bruce, who is in this chat, um, who designed the plugin and made everything happen. Um, so once again, thanks so much for joining us. And I'm going to just pass over to Luba Elliott, who's going to introduce herself and some of the artist's works as well. Hello, thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, so my name is Luba Elliott, and um, I'm an independent curator, researcher and consultant looking at this uh, art and AI space. And um, yeah, so over the past few years or so, I've been looking at the crossover between art and AI and um, have enjoyed looking at the source of different communities that, that become very interested in working with the technology. So I've done a lot of work with the technical community, so with all the researchers who develop AI and present at conferences such as NARIPS, where I have a workshop. And then through some of my curatorial work, I've started getting to learn more of the fine art and media art communities. And it's just been you know, fantastic learning to see how everybody approaches this topic. And um, yeah, I feel this is something that we've managed to bring together in this exhibition. Because with, with Arabite being a gallery that looks at new media art in a, in a very critical fashion, and my practice, which is a bit more technical leaning, I think it's been a great opportunity to work together and uh, to put forward a list of artists who kind of straddle the, the spectrum. And uh, yeah, I think we are lucky to have uh, most of the artists today with us on the call. And um, I think I will, I will introduce briefly kind of the artists and uh, their approaches, and then they will kind of talk about their work themselves, because of course that would be much more exciting for you to hear. And um, yeah, so I'll just give you an overview of uh, the artists we do have uh, in, in the exhibition. So um, we've got uh, some artists with whom I've worked for a number of years already, including um, Sophia Crespo, uh, Jake Elves, and uh, Libby Heaney, as well as artists who've been really um, kind of, uh, yeah, who made the technical community really excited, uh, like Joel Simon with his Gun Breeder and Art Breeder project. And um, through my kind of research in the more critical side and also looking to expand beyond kind of the, the generative, um, art practice, I've also come across uh, Gretchen Andrew and Ben Grosser, who 
who look at um, AI technology in, uh, in quite a different way. So uh, just to talk a, a little bit about each artist uh, individually and starting with, uh, with Gretchen. Um, yeah, so Gretchen does, uh, yeah, she's waving. So you should also wave at her to pretend we're still living in, uh, in not just a digital format. So yeah, Gretchen does a lot of uh, great work that uh, looks at the way search engines um, operate and tries to kind of act as an imperialist and um, conquer the way kind of results are shown uh, through through her work. And uh, I've always been like really impressed with Gretchen's work because whenever there's like a really big art fair or a course such as um, I don't know the way women are depicted online, you could type in a certain um, string of words and then you would see some results. And uh, the, the, part of these results would be some of Gretchen's works. And so she's clearly found a way to tweak some of this uh, recommendation algorithm that powers the system and through that make, make an impact. And to me as a curator, that was you know, uh, really exciting because um, because yeah, this is a really kind of novel way of working with the technology. And as far as kind of all these AI systems go, it's like looking at recommendation algorithms, it's non-generative and it's kind of very different from a lot of the other work in, in the space. And uh, yeah, a lot of the paintings are very beautiful in a very kind of fine art context. So um, kind of that's my... <laughs> Uh, that's my understanding of, um, uh, of of Gretchen. And then next up we have uh, Sophia Crespo and uh, Dark Fractures. You can also see them waving. And uh, they have very skillfully decided to put the background of some of their works uh, as the Zoom background. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's really easy because you can enjoy it right away. And um, in terms of Sophia's work, I've uh, always been impressed with her, with her work beginning with the Neural Zoo series where um, there were all these um, kind of artificially generated creatures that came about through some very crafty manipulation of uh, style transfer algorithms. And uh, I don't know how many of you are, who are listening are from this kind of AI art world or not, but um, style transfer is a is, is, is technique where you kind of uh, change the or, or, or make an image. Um, oh, yeah, transfer the style from one image to another. So it's been typically applied by artists who are kind of looking to um, yeah, change uh, like a photograph into something that's in the style of Monet or Cubism. And so many people from the computational creativity world and from the general art world have always been a little bit um, kind of distant from this technique. And uh, I've always kind of struggled in all my talks and discussions about this technique to find an artist who really does phenomenal work. And I was very happy that uh, Sophia has found, uh, yeah, an, a really kind of innovative way to kind of tweak uh, the style transfer techniques in a way to generate some very kind of beautiful creatures that are very interesting also in a fine art and in a biological way. And then of course now in her newer project, which I think she will speak more about together with Dark Fractures, it's, uh, yeah, it's even more exciting. And uh, next up we have uh, Disnovation. Uh, so that's uh, Nicolas Magré and uh, Maria Raskowska. And I don't think they've, they've joined us on the call today, but um, they do a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of interesting work um, based with uh, kind of Twitter and text and, uh, I remember I saw their work at Transmediale in maybe 2017 or 2018 edition. And at that point in time, it was kind of very fascinating to 
see their work, the predictive art bot, which uh, is a Twitter bot that comes up with lots of different concepts, some of which are quite crazy, particularly if you don't know so much about the contemporary art world. And like in all my talks, I used to have uh, all these like tweets of feminist fridges or like robot vacuum cleaners. I mean, some of these are much more far-fetched than others. And uh, with this predictive art bot, it generates all these concepts for artworks. And uh, in some of the editions of the work, it, there were actual human artists involved who then tried to uh, make the concept real and execute it. And at Transmedia, at one point, there was actually a video that was kind of showing what um, what, what uh, some of the human workers did based on uh, the kind of um, the concept that the algorithm came up with. And um, yeah, to me, that was, uh, yeah, that, that was exciting because of course, in the past, there's always been the case that the human dictates to the machine what we must do. But in that case, it was the other way around. It was kind of the AI or the machine that was kind of telling us, telling the humans what to, Kind of execute. So um, yeah, I was a big fan of that work. And then we have uh, uh, Jake Elves, who who is an artist um, living and working in London. And um, yeah, with Jake, I think we've known each other ever since the beginning of this wave of uh, creative AI. And uh, he's, he, he completed a degree at the Slade School of Art in London. And I don't know how many of you are from London or like know much about Slade, but Slade is kind of, um, I think it's, it's an excellent school that mainly teaches, from my understanding, the more traditional mediums of art. So to me, I, it was like really interesting to see Jake kind of in this traditional environment start learning these new technologies and trying to kind of integrate some of the kind of fine art sensibilities and aesthetics and interests of his into the opportunities presented by these, uh, these technologies. And in our exhibition, we have uh, um, Zizi, which is, uh, which is a procession of uh, drag faces that are kind of generated from a data set using, um, using machine learning. And uh, that's kind of very interesting in a way, partly because it, um, it kind of, it shows the types of data sets that are used in, um, in kind of that, that underpin the machine learning training systems. And uh, some of them are kind of biased and uh, in ways you don't initially expect. So, uh, so, so yeah, his work is, is a great example of some of the kind of generative possibilities. And on the other hand, it also kind of critiques some of the roles of uh, kind of, uh, yeah, gender and um, the way uh, people are depicted. And next, we have uh, Ben Grosser, um, who is also on the call today. And um, yeah, Ben, ben has some interesting work that, uh, that, that again, doesn't, doesn't look so much at the generative possibilities of machine learning systems, which have excited a lot of artists, but rather kind of uh, but rather interrogate the, the, the web systems and uh, look, uh, look more at uh, topics related to kind of surveillance and how you can connect the visitors in um, very big global uh, internet systems to each other through kind of streaming some of the uh, works that can be seen um, through uh, each individual kind of laptops. And yeah, Ben will uh, talk about that later. And uh, then we have uh, Libby Heaney, who, yeah, who has been doing a lot of interesting work, not just with machine learning, but also with quantum computing. And um, I've, I've enjoyed working with Libby also on a number of exhibitions. So starting with uh, kind of looking at um, 
a kind of text generation systems and uh, how they can look at uh, human uh, British identities, like with her Britbot project, to now moving more to uh, working with um, uh, with with the moving image through her works such as uh, Euro Revision and Elvis, which is uh, the work that we have in this exhibition. And um, I think it's it's kind of it's a very interesting uh, mix because Elvis, is, of course, is a, a very well known uh, figure in contemporary like culture, and many of us are familiar with this image. And uh, Libby through the latest deep fake technologies manages to kind of create her own um, kind of visions of her own face as Elvis. And um, yeah, we are kind of, we are able to look at the two and uh, be kind of surprised by some of the similarities and differences. And of course we are presented with an Elvis that is, um, yeah, that, that looks uh, differently at the notions of uh, gender and popular personalities and so on. So I think it's like, it's, it's a really fun work. And then finally, uh, we have uh, Joel Simon with um, Art Breeder. And um, yeah, this is, this is a very exciting addition to um, our exhibition because I think in all the technical communities there's just been kind of so much excitement and discussion regarding kind of uh, Art Breeder and its previous version called uh, kind of uh, Gan Breeder. And um, yeah, so these systems are, and I'm sure Joel will talk in more detail about this, they're kind of made possible with, uh, with the big GAN algorithm and also with some kind of uh, evolutionary uh, related systems that basically mean that lots of, that you can generate um, one image that is kind of similar to a mashup of two or three different images. And that of course offers a lot of opportunities for kind of uh, collaborative uh, creation of images and um, I remember there were also some interesting kind of experiences within the community where like some artists were kind of making work together and then others were, I think, printing it out. And um, there were kind of all these discussion as to actually who owns the IP here or who is kind of the artist or who has the right to do what. And I think these are some of the discussions that we will see happen much more in the future. So I think that would be kind of my roundup of all the different uh, works and artists we have in the show. And uh, of course we have so many more, so many artists um, around here. So I think I'll hand back to Rebecca and then Rebecca can see the best way forward. Sure, thank you Luba. Um... That was really great. Um, for those of you who, ha who have the plugin installed, on the live stream window, you'll see at the bottom that there's a list of all of the artists. Um, and if you click on those names, it will pop up each artist's work. And this is a function that Rob's just enabled for tonight, so that when the artists are talking about their work, um, you can kind of you can experience it in real time as they're as they're speaking about it. Um, so yeah, I don't know who wants to go first. Maybe Gretchen or maybe Libby. Libby, I think you might be on mute. I am on mute. I've just <laughs> done mute. Classic um, Zoom <laughs> behavior. Shall I just go first? I feel like- Can I just say one, one quick thing? There is a 15 seconds lag between our Zoom and the YouTube. So we need to bear that in mind when um, we ask people. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, so I'll go slowly. Um, so um, I'll just talk quickly about my work Elvis, which is part of this show. Um, and to understand Elvis, I think it's quite good to understand where I'm coming from working with sort of new technologies and artificial intelligence in particular here. Um, I guess it goes back to my understanding of the notion of truth. Um, before as an artist, I worked as a quantum physicist for about eight years. And then, 
you see, start to see this reality that's really um, blurry and plural, where there's no sort of kind of fixed, uh, as our AI researchers would call it, they'd say, oh, we need a ground truth. Um, I would say there's probably no ground truth, there's multiple truths, and that's all, all based on, um, on different perspectives, different subjectivities. So when I, so AI, I mean, typically by big tech companies and governments is used to categorize, and that helps to control people, control what we buy, nudge us into buying the next project. So, you know, we all, as, whenever we interact on platforms like Zoom or on Facebook, as you all probably know, we all um, shed data and this is collected by big tech companies and we get put in this category. So what I try to do with a lot of my work is to deconstruct these categories to really start to blur them. Um, so they become so expanded, there's no sort of truth around them um, in the sense that they're, they're no longer recognizable by the very algorithms. Um, I'd like to search them. So I'm kind of using the technology to subvert to subvert the uses of this technology. So with Elvis, I, I made a series of works using deep fakes. Uh, my work, if, if you don't know my work already, it's usually quite humorous. Uh, I find it quite, quite a good way to engage people with all of these quite serious issues around the impacts of new technology like AI. Um, why not be playful and, and make people laugh and, and, and smile within, within that? So I made a series of these deep fake works where I, I use my own body to become these different characters. Um, so in an earlier work that Luba mentioned, due re revision, I became um, Angela Merkel and Theresa May. Um, and as I was making these works, I realized how the algorithms I was using would take my facial features and then map the famous persona to my bone structure. So you get their kind of, you keep your own bone structure, but get, get their features. So you can start to create hybrids depending on how you look versus the other person. Of course, if you wanted to make a perfect deep fake, you can do that using After Effects and so on. To or there's many different ways, but if you want to kind of merge gender's identity to start questioning these categories, um, then then it's quite a fun thing to do. So Elvis, um, it's a two two screen video work, and it basically takes some old footage of Elvis Presley, who obviously has been um, is a very big cultural icon, but also has been used in work by say Andy Warhol and others. And I put my face over this old video footage and, and vice versa. I dressed up in my studio as Elvis and um, put his face over my features. Both pieces neither look exactly like me or him. And what I did actually after I made the work was run the footage through lots of common facial recognition algorithms to see which gender it would spot me as. And the algorithms would flick between male, female, male, female. So I'm kind of doing exactly what I wanted to there. But it's also, there's a lot of sort of feminist um, critique of new technologies and, and, and in general running through my practice. So obviously it thinks about the idea but most deep fakes are used in porn. I think it's something like 95% of deep fakes are porn pornographic and where, where like um, a woman's face is, is superimposed, like a famous celebrity's face is, is put onto a, a porn, porn video, um, which is obviously massively degrading and wrong, but also kind of thinking about the sort of gender imbalances within the music industry. Um, I was even reading today how, I think it's something like 80% of CEOs of record labels are, are men still and zero ethnic minority men. So there's all of these biases and I'm trying to use technology not just to deconstruct the biases within technology, but also to sort of critique the biases in society that are then being replicated in, in technology. So it's quite sort of serious themes, but then made quite playful to engage wide audiences. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. Yeah, I think I think this idea of kind of <clears throat> of gender, especially within data sets, is something that Jake also looks at with ZZ, um, because drag faces or or kind of that it's it's not really recognised by data sets that are predominantly 
male oriented, I guess. Um, but maybe Gretchen, you want to kind of speak a little bit to your work, especially the internet imperialism stuff that you do and the, and the mood boards that you have in real time constraints. Yeah, absolutely. I was just thinking, like, especially coming off of what Libby was just saying, um, in my work, I very much also take a similar approach, like this is really serious stuff, it can get really dark, very techno apocalyptic, but um, look at it in this playful way. Um, and I love that this exhibition um, is taking the form of this virus, because I was just thinking about my work as being this positive virus and I had been talking about my work in terms of positive failures, um, but within the context with all of you, um, we'll talk about them as a positive virus. Um, quickly to back up and um, thank you everyone else who's in this exhibition, um, Luba for curating it, who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years, Arbeit who I've worked with for like, like four or five years, which is really great. Um, and then also for creating the um, extension, Rob. Okay, so in my practice, like what I do is I take images that I make in the studio in this very traditional, um, like on canvas charcoal, um, like history and grounding. And actually if Nimrod was still on video, you could see one of my like on canvas oil paintings in the background of him <laughs> to the right, if he comes back, um, you know, maybe other way. There you go, see those flowers. Um, and what I do is <laughs> I take my um, studio made images and I program them, program them in a way that they become top search results within Google. And by becoming top search results within Google, I'm also reprogramming the artificial intelligence that's underlying Google. Um, the, my favorite positive failure um, that allows me to do this is that the internet can't parse desire, which is to say that um, when I tell the internet through WordPress sites and Pinterest pages that I really, really want the next American president to hold a certain set of values or to be a certain person. Google doesn't understand the difference between me and what I want to be a place of separation. It only takes it and says, what I want is relevant to the next American president. And so all of this meaning gets collapsed into relevance. And so now when you Google, the next American president. My vision boards come up as the top search results, pushing out Trump and anyone else who may run for president in the future. Um, and also like really done in a way where when you click into those images and you go to my website, as people, we totally understand the difference between desire and accomplished fact. The vision boards don't look like fake news. I call them future news, like aspiration as opposed to something fake. And this, like, and also when you take those images and you do a reverse image search on them, Google comes back and says, oh, this is the next American president, um, which means I've really like deeply infiltrated the mind of, of Google. Um, because one of the really inherent flaws within artificial intelligence is that it's entirely backward looking. And this is another thing I love about Libby's work is that if you can only learn based on what has been, then we're, we're continuing to make our world more and more narrow, less and less diverse, less and less weird, less and less interesting. And so by actually taking images that don't yet exist and programming them into AI, we're flipping that direction and we're teaching the internet to be this tool of creativity and possibility, um, which I very much believe that it could be instead of just like, you know, an e-commerce website. So um, the works themselves, these vision boards, um, they're girly, they're feminine. I'm using like gems and flowers and um, these things that really subvert the expectations of what, what artificial intelligence, not just artwork, but like what the whole industry looks like, um, really have been pushing people to see them and try to dismiss them given the actual technical power that is behind them. So like more recently, I've taken that to this like extreme and um, really like I've been enjoying playing in that space and I'm finding it like very feminist as well. 
Um, and then I think the final thing I really want to say, particularly about this exhibition, <clears throat> is it fits really well into this context of how I've been thinking more and more about my practice of, so like when the extension comes up and it's my turn, um, I think like nine of these versions of these vision board images pop up and a couple of my websites pop up. And in that, everybody who has installed the extension, all of the other artists and Arbeit and Luba and everybody are a complicit part of reprogramming Google's AI just by allowing these websites to come up. They're getting hits, they're driving relevance, they're creating meaning. And the um, like more and more of the people that I'm working with, and this really um, has included Arbeit for a long time, there's almost like this complicity around, um, like when I turn this, this work in particular is on political, the next American president, but a lot of my work infiltrates the art world. And as I work with more galleries and I work with real art fairs and real arts publications, anytime anyone anywhere is looking at or talking about my work, they're becoming part of making my aspirations a reality both like on the technical search engine SEO side and like IRL in real life. And there's almost like this like wink, like let's like do this together. Let's like become part of this performance and that like performative nature of like this virus exhibition and getting to be part of it, all of you has just been like, it's, it's really cool. And um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think just going back to what you said about um, the way that if we always kind of produce new things based on what we already know, it kind of doesn't really make for a diverse culture. It doesn't make for a diverse like artist. So I think in that breath, I'd really like to introduce Sophia and Dark Fractures because their project kind of looks at a speculative idea of like an, of a new species that's that's made using AI. So Sophia, do you want to kind of introduce that? Yeah, so hi, and thanks okay. to, yeah, thanks to all of you for, for being here. I love your work, Gretchen, so really nice to, to get to look at it while hearing. Um, and yeah, so our work um, is mainly um, about extracting patterns from nature. So trying to use technologies that wouldn't traditionally be used um, to do these things in this way. So to extract patterns from the natural world around us and to re-visualize them. Um, so to try to see like what is natureness and how can we use artificial neural networks to visualize that. Um, so when I started, uh, as Luba was saying, like one of the first things I worked with was uh, style transfer. So I used style transfer um, in a way to generate textures uh, from different creatures. Like a lot of it is jellyfish, but um, yeah, a wide variety of creatures just to see what are the patterns that make me see like in this picture, there's a jellyfish or there's a bug but it doesn't make a coherent sense because I cannot correlate or I cannot match that to a bug that exists in real life. Um, and well, thanks to Pelican, um, this is a collaborative work. Uh, we, we managed to take that to 3D, which is something that I had been wanting for a while. Um, and yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, that's been really a direct sort of continuation there as so we're exploring nature and how we can, how we can sort of, you know, use especially machine learning and these techniques to, to explore the natural diversity. I mean, no matter how crazy an insect we've, specimen, for example, we've managed to generate every time we look at insects, we find one even wilder out there in nature. It's even more incredibly creative and colorful than what we, you know, the AI has managed to produce. So it's, it's been like a very interesting way of learning a greater appreciation of biodiversity as well. This seemingly sort of like almost a bit uh, nonsensical attempt at replicating the real world actually leads to a greater sort of appreciation to it, at least for us mm -hmm. as part of this process. And also I think it's, it's a very interesting 
way of examining one's own subconscious bias, especially with what we often take for granted, which is nature. We have a very, we take nature for granted, it's there. And very often we have certain ideas of what's natural, what's an insect, what's not an insect. And it's been very interesting to sort of see how machine learning and AI, all these algorithms, they, they work with what you feed them. So if you only feed them a certain thing, you're only gonna get some understanding or essential understanding of that back at you. And I think this has been very interesting to explore how we have so many of these subconscious biases, not only in relation to each other as people, but also to nature. And I think that there's a commonality in those mechanisms, which has been quite fantastic. Yeah, and so for this particular work, what we wanted to do is create like a mini archive uh, of five specimens um, of like neural networks interpretation of what a bug is like. So we fed it 3D data of bugs. Um, and then we generated a set of textures um, and turned them into, well, a little video, <laughs> video texture. And we also generated anatomies for each of the bugs. So I'm like, I think something that moves us is how, um, kind of how science would look at this specimen. So how like, can we generate um, like a biological archive um, of something that doesn't exist? And, and yeah, that's, that's it, basically. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting about the archiving, because I think that's something that's quite prevalent in GAN breeder, right, Joel? So the way that you kind of choose parent images to to remix and essentially breed new things that don't exist yet. Um, so if you could talk about that, that would be really great. But also kind of the way in which you've made the interface really approachable to people who don't really perhaps have an understanding about how it works. So you've made it very user friendly in that way. Yeah, <clears throat> happy to talk about that. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, so briefly about Art Breeder. So Art Breeder is a creative tool that I, you know, was inspired by, um, I guess, the design properties of breeding, of the beauty of flowers or, or vegetables or even dogs, things that we've created. And um, as a creative process about uh, kind of like inspiration and augmenting that discovery process. Um, and so Art Breeder is a website where you can kind of mix images, you can mix two together. Um, a lot of creativity is kind of combinatorial, knowing what things might go well together and experimenting or discovering or kind of fostering. And so it tries to kind of augment that exploration process and foster um, collaboration. And so it uses machine learning um, as, you know, because it represents the images a certain way as kind of, you know, it, it uses machine learning, but it's kind of a means to an end of, um, you know, the technology is kind of this connective tissue of this, I guess, creative superorganism that has emerged out of the community. And so, you know, it does take kind of a network approach to the creative process. So thinking about, you know, creativity as an interpretation of the images, but also as something within the network of all the users. Um, and so for the so it was interesting because at first I was very excited to take it offline because it is a, an online, an online tool. And so it was exciting to get it off the computer. And then um, thinking about it, had to have it work as a Chrome extension was actually pretty interesting kind of keeping it online. And so, you know, I didn't want something that looked like the tool. I mean, obviously I don't want anything like self-promotional um, or like resembling the tool directly. So I was really excited to um, kind of go in the other direction and, and interview users of the tool and think, talk up to them about their understanding of the technology and um, how they use it in their process rather than something that more abstract about machine learning. And so it was really interesting to kind of hear how they thought about it. Um, and then to kind of tie those, um, tie their ideas together. And then I actually, so there's like a generative video um, that basically as they're talking, it kind of starts merging their images together. Um, and you kind of see it unfold in real time in the browser. Um, so yeah, that's um, mostly it. It was really, yeah, it's really great to like, I think focus on on the people. Cause I think um, Art Breeder tries to, you know, to not, I mean, it uses technology, but 
always as like a means to the creative process happening um, for, for the users. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe that, that, well, that brings us to Ben. Um, ben, do you want to introduce tracing you and kind of your practice as a whole? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Um, first, I just want to thank Rebecca and Luba and Nimrod and Rob for, um, for the exhibition. It's been, I mean, Arbyte does so much great work in digital art. And uh, I really appreciate the way this particular exhibition played out as an extension. As someone who makes browser extensions, that, that is the form that some of my work takes. Um, it was unexpected in a very happy way that the form of the exhibition ended up being a browser extension. Um, and strangely enough, in my case, it was a work that isn't a browser extension that ends up getting integrated into the browser extension. Um, but that's how it goes, right? Uh, in a good way. Um, so most broadly, my practice, I'm interested in how the designs of software and how the structures of the web construct humans as users. Um, how the way that digital technology is made ends up dictating how we feel, how we think, and how we behave when we're online and offline. And so um, sometimes that means I make work that has um, used AI in generative ways, whether it's a robot that paints or performs with musicians, or whether it's a, a computer that watches movies and tries to react to what it sees. Um, sometimes it's uh, works that manipulate social media systems or you know, in ways that try to change how we understand the interface or um, or get in the way of some of the profiling that those social media systems are doing to us and, and, and on us all the time. Um, all of this, you know, it, like a, a theme throughout this work of mine is, is, is how we see computers, but also how they see us back and what the effects are of the way that they see us and how the, the way that we learn to act through social media and networks and the way that they're designed and the, and the knowledge of being subject to being watched all the time changes how we behave, what we say, what we do, what we don't do. And so with this work, Tracing You, I put a, you can load it from the extension um, you could also just go to tracingu.bengrosser.com and it will load it up in the web browser. Um, it's, it's a, it presents a website's best attempt to see the world from where you all are right now. So anyone who visits this website um, becomes one of the six tiles that you see. And the, the images that you see loading um, are, are each new visitor arriving at the site. and, and the, the software using whatever information you give to every website, um, whether, you know, just in terms of IP address and, and other things, no special permissions. Um, and it tries to get as close as it can to find an image of what it looks like where you are right now. And sometimes this can be an eerily accurate image. It could be um, literally, it could be an image inside the building that you're in. It could be an image from the street outside. Um, it could be down the street or maybe down the road further away. Um, and sometimes it can be pretty wildly dislocated. It may be really far off uh, in some cases. Um, but what it's doing is it's making transparent the potential visibility of one's location on the earth without giving up more information than you give to every other website on the web. And so by making its surveillance capacity transparent and overt, uh, you know, the way I think about it is that the work provokes consideration of how networks are built and configured, operated and distributed, um, and how this affects one's own visibility within the system. For some of you, it might be coming up very close, but if you're using an obfuscation system like a VPN or Tor, it, it, it's going to be way off. So it starts to reflect um, these uh, ways of, of navigating the web. But at the same time, as it's doing right now, it produces a, a mutual watching where uh, 
you know, you can see what you look like to the system, but you can also watch everyone else at the same time as they are also doing the same thing. And so in that way, it models other computer systems and network based systems that make us more or less visible. Um, and, you know, here I'm thinking of, of the way that social networks, um, uh, for example, uh, depend on our desire to be visible and, and how they construct in us a desire to be visible. Um, this, this work's been out for a while. I originally made this in late 2015 for um, a, uh, an exhibition in Paris and um, it got written about a bunch. And so it got commented on and, and people wrote about their reactions to it. And sometimes looking at those can be uh, fairly uh, instructive. And, you know, sometimes people load this and they're, you know, a reaction that is not uncommon is uh, one of fear. Um, so, you know, people freaked out, wait, wait, you can see where I am. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Not necessarily an unexpected reaction. Sometimes people are excited. I've seen people grab screenshots and post them online very excitedly to show that the work has um, found them. Um, and, and that feels like a good thing to some people. Um, uh, but the unexpected reaction that came across for me was one of fear, uh, or sorry, one of anger. Um, but it's not the anger I would have expected. Um, it's not anger over being surveilled. It's anger over the surveillance not being more accurate than it is. It's that people load it up and they see that the image that represents them is maybe a mile down the road and they get angry that this website that said it would trace you wasn't literally outside their door. <laughs> um, and I think what this reveals is just how conditioned we've become um, by the structures of the web and the systems we use to be not only accepting of continuous surveillance, but to be desiring of it, that social networks in particular uh, produce in us a desire for visibility. You know, we learn through Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever it might be that um, the way to have power in those systems is to be more visible than we were yesterday. And um, I think that's part of what this ends up, this work ends up reflecting is that, uh, you know, being visible is the key that permits entry into and full participation into all these different systems of interaction. And it's part of how we gain visibility. And um, so it's really this desire for visibility that I think this work ends up revealing um, in, in users. And thinking about it now in the, in the current context um, with the pandemic, I, you know, the Tracing, of course, is one of these uh, words that we're hearing all the time um, now, contact tracing, for example, uh, that, uh, you know, there's, there's now a new imperative to be very transparent to governments and state systems and corporations um, for public health to reveal and be willing to reveal where you are at any moment in time so that um, one could figure out if you were near someone else who was infected. And um, of course, there's good public health reasons for doing this. And it makes sense, um, in a, at least in a, if you live in a country that kind of takes a, a, a rational approach to how to manage the current moment. Um, but so it's, it's an interesting moment from my perspective because the way in which we are going to be asked and are being asked and expected to be even more accepting of systems that report our every move and location all the time is um, necessary at the same time. It's going to, uh, every app we load that does this is going to assure us that it's gonna keep your data private and it's going to um, be uh, really good with you and for you and to you and not abuse anything. And that is not the record that most every company and government that um, does this work or has does this, done this work in the past um, has much uh, history to support. So 
Um, so this, the idea that we're being traced all the time, anyway, it just seemed like it had some interesting um, overlaps with the current moment. But uh, thanks, and I really appreciate um, being a part of the exhibition. And it's been really fun watching, having everybody's work interrupt my day all afternoon. Um, and you know, even that moment of trying to make the decision, am I gonna stop and pay attention to this work? Or is it, am I going to treat it like it's getting in the way and push it away as quickly as possible? I feel like part of what this exhibition is doing that's really interesting to me is it forces reflection on that moment of do we want to uh, only focus on what we're already doing or do we are we willing to let any other system get in the way and of course we're letting systems get in the way all the time we just don't necessarily think about it that way uh, so i really appreciate getting to see all of your works it's been it will continue to be a treat for the next you know a couple months here i'm just going to leave it on thanks great um thank you ben and everyone else for talking about the work it's very very um, interesting, I think, to start a conversation um, about, well, there's, there's so much to be discussed about, and some of these things will be talked about during the panel discussion that will be on the 6th of August. Um, but something that we didn't talk about much, but you did touch about that then, now in, in uh, presenting your work, is how, how things are being distributed, especially nowadays. Um, and, and through that kind of the conversation of, of exhibition making and curation um, and distribution, uh, and especially nowadays um, where there's so much online content that one, even more so from before, that one is being bombarded with uh, from working online to taking part in different exhibitions or openings or all sorts of, of things that are happening online, I think, um, and, and Gretchen also talked about is how, how do you make a room for yourself? How do you make space to, to not just being exhibited, but to not take, on one hand, take part in whatever is happening, but also be a bit more um, conscious about everything that's happening around us in the world in the last couple of months. Um, I think I don't, I don't have any specific question, but I think it's important to, to recognize that and also for us as, as an organization institution is what do we put out there and what we don't put out there to what extent do we uh distribute and, and it's quite different when you think in a gallery context where everything is physical and everything is we need to attract people to come to the gallery but i think the solution that we came up with for this exhibition of, of something that is part of your daily routine that is not uh, on one hand, it does confront you with certain things when we decided once every hour or so. Um, and, and I think that the parallel between that and social media and surveillance is very, very interesting. Um, I think that it, it's worth, I don't know whether we want to go down to this conversation now, because I know there will be more talk uh, in the event, but if you want to respond to that, like what, as an artist, what, how much do you put out there nowadays? Don't know if it's just for you, Ben, or for everyone. I mean, yeah, I'm happy to respond. I think it's a it's a complicated question. I, you know, for me, some of my work you you know takes on surveillance in various ways, um, whether it's emotional profiling on Facebook or the way that the NSA reads your email um, or um, how you're seen <clears throat> by networks, for example. And I get asked a lot, especially as someone who does a lot of work in social media, like, well, do you hate social media or how are you, how visible are you on social media? Like, and, you know, do you, do you use every privacy tool available? Like how private are you is a question I get asked a lot. And the answer for me is usually one of like, well, I know I, I have great knowledge of how much I should be using every privacy tool and how much I shouldn't be revealing everything on social media. But I not only feel any way that I probably can't help myself, but it's also occupationally um, advantageous to do so. Um, it, I mean, it's kind of like a requirement, like I have to live in the soup that I am playing with. And so 
Um, and so I have, so I, so I put a lot of things out on social media uh, and, and other locations and don't, can't help giving up some of that, that information. I think it's, I think this just reflects the wider question that we're all embedded in now. You know, there's a, you'll get a, there's always a, there's a, seems like there's a new wave every couple of months, at least in the United States of, of hashtag delete Facebook, for example, just to, to take one example. And, but it's not really changing much, right? It doesn't matter how many scandals there are. It doesn't matter um, how bad things get. It doesn't matter all the different new ways that are revealed that your data is getting misused and used to target you and elections and all kinds of things. People don't get off the system. They just, the, the growth is fine from, even the ad boycott against Facebook, Zuckerberg's reaction was, well, I'll wait and see how the metrics look. And if, as long as they look good, I don't really care about all this ad boycott stuff is kind of his attitude. And I think it's, it's because these systems are, which are corporate controlled by very few individuals, very little diversity in those companies um, are uh, fundamental infrastructure for society now. And so it's not easy to just turn off. I can't just, I mean, for a lot of people being on some social media platform is a requirement of their profession. Um, it's a requirement to be connected with family and friends. It's a requirement to know about what's going on around them, um, whether it's their neighborhood or their community, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. And so um, there's this fundamental conflict of we have private corporations in control of all this information that we're constantly giving them. And so that feels wrong. And at the same time, if we don't do that, that we don't participate in the wider conversation that these systems enable. So that's why I focus on trying to get in the middle of those systems um, and, and screw with them as much as I can. Um, but it's, just, a, it's a complicated choice, yeah. I was just saying like, um, I kind of take a related approach where I look at, um, I think of myself sort of as like a systems artist. Like there's these systems that we exist and that we live within. And the poise within my practice is not how do I dismantle the system, but how do I make it work for me in a way that it wasn't designed to do? And the kind of, you know, it, it's not so much, at least the poison I practice isn't so much about making like the ideal internet. It's about like me taking in like this feminist way, this power and being like, I'm gonna make all of this just work for me. It wasn't designed for me but I couldn't do what I do without the existing system being there. So like, I'm with you, I share like so much, I put so much out there and like the result is that like, it's creating the life that I want, an internet that I want. And then people should see that power grab as like both like kind of cool and also like disturbing um, like in this like simultaneous way. Yeah, it's like a, it's an interruption, right? It's an interruption to the status quo. But I just feel like <clears throat> I I agree with you and Ben on that. You know, these these kind of systems that we all use, and why do we all use them? Um, it's because there aren't really alternatives that are as big or as easily accessible um, to them to Facebook or to Instagram. I mean, even now we're using Zoom, um, so. Yeah, it's kind of, it's difficult to get away from, but I think works like yours, Gretchen and Ben's and Libby's in some way, it's kind of like, it's going against the grain and it's kind of taking agency over something which we might feel powerless to, I guess, as a single person, as a single entity, I guess. Um, but I actually have a question um, from the YouTube chat um, by someone called Merz Mensch. And they say, do you people feel yourself like avant-garde? Like in the 1920s, the Dadaists, they scrutinized traditional art and culture. A hundred years later, you will question conventions and society. Um, so do you, do you feel avant-garde? I know I just said something, but in lieu of anyone else at the moment, please interrupt me if you decide. Um, like my work very much like 
the institutional critique within it, especially when I turn it towards the art world and not just onto the political system, um, it fits very much within this, like this big tradition um, well, of institutional critique while also retaining an uncomfortable closeness to wanting to be part of those institutions and to wanting to be part of a traditional um, worldly success and power model. Um, so I don't really consider myself to be avant-garde. It's just like a, a rearranging of existing elements. Um, like I just said, like the poise is very much like, well, I'm not gonna dismantle the system. I'm just gonna make it work for me. And that's a bit of a poise because I do have a very activist side to what I do, but that's like the, um, kind of the feeling at the, the heart of my work. Yeah, I love the question. It's, and I think it's an important one. Um, in a traditional notion of the avant-garde, the answer is probably no. I think along with Gretchen, I would kind of see it that way. But I think that the current moment and the massive consolidation and centralization of everything through networks, from my perspective, requires maybe an extension of the avant-garde into the insider position. <laughs> Um, you know, we're not going to, you know, to, to go back to Rebecca's point of, you know, we don't have alternatives and it's important to have alternatives. Otherwise, we're not, how are we going to do anything? And so one way of looking at this um, is, well, you just got to build alternatives. And there are, there are great people working to do that and, and imagine alternatives and do alternatives by building systems completely outside of the current centralized networks. But from my perspective, when you have 3 billion users on one company's platform, it also requires creating work that reveals to those everyday users how you don't have to treat those systems the way they want to be treated. That you can, um, and I think that's what Gretchen's definitely doing with her work um, by changing what the results are in Google, I think, um, you know, you, just because a system asks you to report how you feel doesn't mean you have to accurately report how you feel. You can say you're sad if you're happy. You can say you're um, in love if, you're, if you hate something. Um, it, it, just by presenting that gesture, I think, you know, is a necessary step to getting people to be willing to go and look at alternatives, to show them that the way you act on a, on a social network, for example, is very much how the network wants you to act. And if you don't want to act that way, you first have to realize that you don't have to act that way. And, and so that's part of how I try to do it. So I think from my perspective, this is where I would say, avant maybe we could say avant-garde can also be done from within the system as long as it's aimed at pushing people eventually outside of those systems. And you could, people can disagree, but that's kind of how I think about it. Yeah, I think, I think it also means that people have to acknowledge that they're within this web of relations and connections with other things, right? Because without that acknowledgement, maybe there's no real understanding of how they can um, subvert it or kind of go against it, disrupt it. Um, and actually I think, there's also kind of this argument that that these systems or these platforms, you know, they is there a way for them to tolerate silence or intimacy or as a use for critique, as you and Gretchen have done, you know, there's kind of they don't really allow for that. I mean, just look at Instagram influencers or whatever, you know, it's, it's the more followers you have. It's the louder voice you have. It's kind of like the power you assert over your followers, I guess, is is what makes you successful or famous in that way but it would be interesting to think about a platform or an alternative social media that can encourage silence and like inward thinking and inward processing I guess um I actually have another question uh from the chat oh wow it's really long yeah, um, um I can I can jump in with art reader real quick maybe just before the next one um yeah. I guess I guess one answer to that is I guess I guess some of the other works Art Reader does I guess try to you know make the internet work in a, a different way um, you know keep it kind of a, a, in moving in more of a weird and, and creative and collaborative place I think in, in, in regards to the question I think maybe you know I guess and also Art Reader is also kind of an optimistic it's it's less critical in that way which um, 
you know, here's, here are the ways that technology can actually be useful for creativity. It's kind of an optimistic approach, but I do think it takes a slightly different approach with regards to ownership. And I do think it does try to challenge certain ideas of, of authorship and ownership, um, particularly where things are so continuous and there's no definition of ownership. You know, last year we had an event where a bunch of us collaborated on something and we submitted it to an art competition with like a hundred co-authors. So um, kind of taking some of the thinking about authorship from, from science, you know, we have these papers with thousands of co-authors um, and art obviously due to the economics um, and, and culture, you know, has that as, that not as much, but obviously like, you know, ideas don't exist in vacuums and in many ways you could, you could think of the authorship, the authorship just purely from a, from a network approach. And so I think maybe art readers will, to the question Amagar in terms of like maybe challenging ideas about what, who or what is the author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually that's quite nicely fitting to the way that this exhibition came about because it was, as much as it was me and Luba choosing the artists, it, the idea for the plugin actually came from a conversation that we had initially that I, me and Nimrod had initially with Gretchen and a few other of the a few others in the show, um, and then it was a back and forth between all of you guys and Rob to try and figure out the best way for this. So it wasn't really it was it, it's a it's definitely a collaborative exhibition in that way. Um, which is really nice. Um, but thanks, thanks Joel for that. Um, I'm just gonna ask this question from YouTube. Um, okay, so I have a question about how we as digital online artists remain unruly within the medium. It seems like online art is on the cusp of either being subsumed into informational capitalism and authoritarianism as the mechanism by which its injustices are concealed or is no platformed completely through the rampant privatization of the internet. So I guess I wanted to hear about how you think we can navigate making work in and with a hyper-capitalist, hyper-authoritarian system and retain the autonomy to use the knowledge we might have to break, improve, update, destroy that system without just being swallowed up by it. It's quite long, sorry. So I, I think one of the, um, like the art world is a system and capitalism is also a system. And I think one of the biggest coups that we doing what we do can give to capitalism is to get people to pay us money for these criticisms and these projects. And I know that's again, part of this uncomfortable like closeness to the system and within it, but like that, that to me is like, it's so exciting to be part of a system that will pay you for what we're doing. And it, it's like, it's difficult, but it's also like part of seeing the rules. How do you exhibit? Who do you talk to? Like, how do you build the community? And like, um, then once you're there, your power within it and what you do from there, like has to be different. Um, can I jump in a bit here as well? I mean, totally different approach to um, what we've been hearing so far and probably related to the previous question, thinking a bit about Ada in some sense, I suppose, just kind of, it's, it's a short comment, I suppose, is, is thinking about if things stay fluid and in flux. So if you can keep, say for instance, with my work, changing my identity, changing kind of how things appear, um, I've worked a lot with text, deconstructing text, ripping language apart, referencing Dada poetry, then it's hard to become appropriated by capitalism because it tries to like pin you down. What is the commodity? What is the product here? But then it's changed and moved on to something else. Um, I don't know how that bodes well as an artist because it's it's quite slippery as such, um, unlike Gretchen, um, you know, when what you're putting out is, is, is always changing perhaps somewhat than um, what you look like or what you're trying saying because you're reworking and using these systems, AI systems to um, scramble and, and hybridize everything, then um, yeah, you don't often sort of have this brand identity. Um, yeah, so that's my, what I thought would be quite interesting to add to that. Yeah, yeah I could, um, I, I really like Libby's answer. Like, I think the, 
being genuine or not genuine. Capitalism wishes us to be genuine in the way we present ourselves because otherwise the ads aren't appropriately targeted. And um, not that ads being the only aspect of, of capitalist systems, but in terms of how a lot of these online systems are run and funded now, that is, that is the model. So, you know, making yourself not look the way you look, making yourself not appear the way you feel, um, or, you know, these, like how, what your profile is, I think, um, is one technique for trying to uh, subvert some of these systems, uh, not only for yourself, but in potentially enabling others to do that as well. Yeah, and to, um, I agree with everything said, and to jump onto the autonomy part of it, I think, you know, it's worth saying that, you know, the Chrome extension is hosted by Google, Art Breeder is all dependent on Amazon. Um, there's a huge kind of chain of dependencies that's, you know, the foundation of, you know, probably most online, online works. And so, you know, it's a little less visible, of course, but it's, it's basically what, what keeps everything going. That is definitely like a core, core dependency of much of the system. I think it might also be interesting or important to bring in um, the privilege that we all have of having access to the internet and having um, some level of disposable income that we can kind of support ourselves with and kind of it enables us to kind of to protest or to be activists in whatever way on the internet whereas you know not not all artists and get paid for what they do and actually there are lots of people kind of really trying to make change that they don't get recognized they're not they don't see themselves as artists they don't get paid so i think it's it's also about us recognizing that we are in such a state of privilege that we are able to kind of uh to make work and to kind of provoke discussion and critique in this way um because not 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 everybody has that voice right especially at the intersection of art and tech in the US and I think in other places as well, um, to get an arts education is so expensive and so elite. And then the tech world is also elite in a similar, similar demographic way. I think that's a great point, Rebecca. Yeah, and, and also like, you know, to have the sort of background to as Gretchen like reprograms the internet and, you know, we have this ability to like have the time and space to learn how to do some of these very technical things as well um so it's not just about maybe a formal education but it's about having that that sort of yeah the time to do these things yeah um Nimrod do you have anything else you want to add um I just move outside um I think I think there's there's this idea of systems that we keep repeating and and our program this year is very much kind of trying to look at the system that we all operate in and not, not necessarily critiquing, but just see where we stand with relations to that. Um, and I think that more so nowadays is, is trying to think of what, what was the system that operated, um, sorry for the noise, um, before what we're doing now and, and whether, whether there's, there's ways of kind of looking slightly at the past and, and, and and try to analyze how we how we led how we got into this position now at what what point we lost not lost track but what point we allowed these things to take part and take control of, of everything and 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 i wonder if there's any other system that we can think of that we're so dependent on um that we just accepted it and took it for granted without really criticizing it um i don't have any kind of something that springs to mind at the moment, but I think it's something that's worth thinking is one of the things that kind of led us to, to, to where it is now. Um, yeah. So in the US, there's a huge reevaluation of the police and the prison system um, finally happening that it's like very similar, um, really thinking about where those things came from and why they are the way they are right now. Um, it's even more disturbing than like I would have thought. Yeah, I think that's a great reference. It not only, and also, you know, we have all these calls in the US right now to defund the police. And even that, then the usual reaction to that is, well, that's impossible. We're not going to do that. 
you know, that's, and, and it goes right to scare techniques of how it would be. There's no way we could live without this system. It's absolutely impossible. You, you would be unsafe. And uh, this is the reaction that we get with every system that we talk about being subject to and wanting to change or, or escape in some way. So the status quo protects the status quo. Um, and so I think looking, I mean, I think it's a great question. I don't have a, a list of great answers off the top of my head, but I'll be thinking about it because um, history has been dealing with this over and over, right? And, and this is also something that we'll be discussing, I guess, in the next panel discussion about the role of artists in, in disrupting and intervening uh, within those systems and, and at what point do you push the barriers uh, to create these tensions that allows you to operate within the system from within almost and, and slowly tweak it to something different and, and kind of brings a lot of other speculation and, and ideas that um, again will be discussed in, in the next meeting. So it's very important to bear that in mind. Yeah, something from the from the perspective of like more what we are doing and nature. Um, a question that we get asked often is uh, why why are you uh, using machine learning to visualize nature? I mean, if you like nature so much, why don't you just um, work with organic materials and why don't you just stay uh, within that? medium rather than um, going for something that's perceived as like the polar opposite um, of nature and I think that well at least I can say for me but for us it's uh, important to like find a way of representing nature within technology but also understanding technology as a product of organic life um, if we see humans as part of organic life um, rather than uh, separated from it. And I think in a way uh, it kind of like this line of thought applies as well to this uh, like systemic questions. So yeah. and I think it also it has a lot to do with the fact that we often I think take for granted reach that's especially, I mean, all these systems now that ties together social networks and so on, they afford us a reach that, you know, just for 10, 15 years ago would almost be unthinkable to, you know, have so many followers, so many different ways of getting hundreds of thousands of impressions every time you post something. There's a reach that before would be very difficult to have. And I think that it's often very easy to take that for granted that within these constraints, there are actually positive opportunities for reach and of course, then for subversive messages and alternative narratives. But at the same time, of course, we're in a system that is has an architecture which is designed to feed upon the fear of FOMO, the fear of missing out. And I think there's also great potential to enter that uncomfortable zone of thinking about, uh, do I need to have such a great reach? Can I make, you know, a disconnected sub-community that has a limited reach, but still perhaps might reach, you know, many more people than if I put something out on the sidewalk. You know, there are different ways of thinking about this. And I think that we, we can be more critical of which scales we engage in. Do we have to engage in like the full public via social network scales or other other scales and how can they complement each other when we're working with something that, you know, can be so flexible as a digital, you know, anyone can host a website. Anyone can build a cluster of services, you know, with, after reading a few GitHub <laughs> readmes. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot in there for ways of pushing further what we often take for granted as a substrate now. Just as a by the way. Yeah, that's already good. Point. Trying to unmute, but can I just sort of ask Sophia and um not in your name, Dark Fractures, <laughs> a question. Um, like Rebecca posed the question um, a short while ago about how um, are there really any systems that we sort of depend on uncritically? And obviously an answer to that is, is nature. Um, and, and so, but yeah, that's the one that's being depleted and, and exhausted the most. Um, what? What are your thoughts on that in relation? I mean, maybe this is such a big question to kind of finish on, because I guess we're wrapping up soon. But 
Um, what are your thoughts on that, if any, Sophia? And, and, um... I think you have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big topic. Um, yeah. I think that sort of just like to sort of dip briefly into it, I think there's, because of the way our society has become structured, at least in sort of the Western context, where we also have the, the highest degree of consumption, we have very, we have a, we inherit our society and our cultural views and our cultural values. And these aren't always not only just like a ver horizontal hierarchy, they're also vertical hierarchy where we often place nature as a commodity, especially within the capitalistic thinking. And I think that this is also reflected in the sort of, in the interhuman uh, aspect as well, um, how we often have very segregated also online communities. There's lack of inclusivity has been the, a huge issue. And this of course is equally valid for nature. And I think that by trying to work within the digital realm, we can iterate a lot quicker and experiment a lot more with how can we create new ways of experiencing the other, that other, if it's human or non-human. And um, because there are no good answers to that, but I think that a crucial part of trying to sort of shift the narrative in a more sustainable direction is learning to build a new story about our worldview that can accommodate a more sort of diverse, more inclusive balance and value set within that. And I think that when we have such a rich and such a powerful, you know, um, playground as the digital world, which allows us to iterate, experiment, A, B test, A, B, C test, you know, we can play a lot more with these things. And I think within that lies that the validity of exploring this digitally um, within that system, because we can, you know, try and, you know, evolve a little quicker because there is a lot of, there is an awful lot of overlap between the human and the non-human and how we treat what we deem as others. So I think therein at least lies something there. I could run for a couple of hours, but <laughs> I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody for joining us tonight and thanks to you guys for <clears throat> speaking so wonderfully about your work. Um, are there any final closing remarks or shall we just cut it here? No? Cool. Okay, well, for everybody who's watching, if you're still watching and if you haven't downloaded the plugin, please go to rbi.com slash real time constraints and you can download it for Chrome or Firefox. Um, and yeah, you can just enjoy it for the next few weeks. Um, as Nimrod said, Luba will be, um, there'll be a panel discussion, Luba will be moderating and it'll be about how that we can make change in the AI industry and there'll be a couple of the artists present on that. So do keep uh, up to date with our website. I'll be posting more information about it soon. Um, but yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Um, Thank thanks. you very much. You're Thank welcome. you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Till next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>